Anyway, so like she said, my name is Corey. This is Matt. Uh, we're, both, we're both architects. We've been uh, uh, studying and practicing architecture for about six years now. And we recently started developing our game called Homemade. And um, to us, Matt and I, uh, architecture, the build work of architecture, will always be extremely important to us, extremely relevant. Um, but what, what we want to focus on specifically for this talk is about representation in architecture and specifically how architects um, convey their ideas um, to their clients and to uh, the public in general. And uh, build work has a lot of constraints that come with it. And generally speaking, uh, these constraints always make their way back into representation and the kind of abstract way architects express their designs. And in a way, that, that feedback loop between representation and, and the build form of architecture is something that we find uh, very interesting. Yeah, so I think it's safe to say for uh, most architects, the ultimate relic is a uh, built project. However, there is this long lineage of architects practicing purely in like abstract two-dimensional representation. In architecture, these are known as paper architects. They were just on paper. There's actually now recently in LA specifically, there's been a lot of digital architects which work only in the digital realm, which is kind of exciting. And what's really important about this lineage of architects is they've really pushed what representation can mean for um, for architecture. So first in like short history of these types of paper architects. Here we see uh, Piranesi. He's using this uh, 2D like, uh, mode of representation, this perspective, to get at ideas of what this architectural space can be like. And you can see that uh, I don't, like, in real life, this, you wouldn't be able to construct a building like this. There's even certain spatial uh, things that wouldn't work out. Stairs are leading to like, ambiguous landings, or are they just a wall? Um, again, something he can only do in this two dimensional uh, form of representation. Uh, moving on, we have this one. The cenotaph for Isaac Newton by Boulay. And um, here again, he's, he's playing with, uh, without the constraints of construction, economy, maybe physics, that shell looks a little thin. Um, but he's, he's doing this in order to uh, understand this new scale of architecture and helping us imagine it through this uh, section drawing and this representation. You can see the little people there at the bottom, um, just how, imagine how big this space would actually be. Uh, so something that's really interesting about uh, the representation as a technique for architects um, is that it's, talking about constraints, it's freed from any sort of need to understand architectural drawing conventions to really understand what, what the architect's intent might be, what the design might be like. And I think that's a specific quality that's in architecture that has no doubt contributed to its widespread acceptance in not just the profession, but also outside of the profession as well. And so, what these uh, the acceptance of, of the rendering and the abstracts, um, not and then also just the ease at which it's how easy it is to do these sorts of images now with the computer. Um, you get these crack new practice models. So this is a, a rendering done by the firm called Luxigon, and Luxigon is an architectural firm that does these hyper real um, images uh, for other architects, and then those architects use those images to. Uh, show them to their clients or to the public or to builders. And so um, what's interesting is that, you know, architecture, architecture doesn't look like this. It, it looks nothing like this. Um, but what it tells us is something about atmosphere, it tells us something about tectonics, light, form, potentially use. Um, but what it really is showing is ultimately desire. You know, and I think there's this common misconception that uh, representation or rendering is supposed to be showing what architecture can be, but in fact I think what it's showing is uh, what architecture can be. You know, it can never be, can never be this beautiful and you'll never experience it, you know, in this way. And so, um, with all the images that we're showing you and all the representations, I think what's important to note is that um, uh, it's, it's about constraints and that con the constraints of paper architects never go away. And so even if the connection to reality for these people is, is extremely thin, um, they're always there. It's just that certain constraints that build architects deal with then take a second seat to the sort of um, constraints that paper architects deal with. And it allows them to understand um, different properties of architecture in, in, a, in a different way. And so the, the nagging thought, I think, in the back of all architects' minds, even the paper ones, is, you know, what if it, what if it were to be built? I think there's always that thread there. And I think um, it's not just about buildability, but it's something about scale, it's something about tectonics, and the actual ability to build. 
So another example of um, a paper architecture is Plugin City by Archigrain. Um, here we can see them using the representation again. They're not dealing with economies or constraints. We're using this vision, this uh, city where if we took our lives and modulated uh, every part of our life, and they provide this system that you can plug in. You can see those are like little modules that are making the city um, from that. And with this mobile representation, it, they're kind of suggesting that it can go on infinitely. Um, but it's important to point out that it's still on the horizon, right? That like, it's not just empty space. There's still dealing with these constraints that, like, maybe someday it could be built. But again, this is allowing uh, this using uh, this form of representation is allowing them to explore these ideas without um, having to deal with those constraints. Here is a Nakamura Capsule Tower uh, by Kuro Kawa. And uh, what's important to note is it's sort of trying to get the same ideas that Plugin City was getting at, but this is in fact a build work. And we don't think that the build work is subservient to the uh, paper architecture or to the representation, or nor is to your representation subservient to the build work. What we have here is just a whole different um, amount of constraint that they're dealing with, i.e. construction and economy. However, um, there's possibilities opened up by actually building this building that aren't possible in the paper architecture. You know, there's real people living out their lives in these capsules, and it's a, just, it just opens up more possibilities when you construct it like this, that paper architecture can necessarily do. Um, so as, as Matt said, I think what's super important to take away is that um, no, nothing is subservient when it comes to architecture. To the architect, the plan drawing has just as much importance as the final build form. The animation, the model, all these forms of representation that architects use have just as much importance in the profession. It's just that each single piece of, piece of these comes with its own set of constraints and possibilities that allow architects to understand certain properties of a design. And so by understanding one, you understand the small piece of a much larger picture. And that they're all kind of on the same level of, of capital A. You know, they're all capital A architecture. And going back to kind of our own personal interests uh, in the field of architecture, um, this, is a, this is a drawing by Hugh Ferris um, displaying uh, Manhattan zoning laws. And so zoning laws um, in architecture are these sort of rules set forth that, um, so for instance, let's say in New York, there's a certain height, once you get above a certain height to a building, you're building on this kind of invisible plane that says you can't build, you have to kind of step back from the site in order to allow light and air down to the street level and kind of have a certain livability and habitat for the people down, down on the sidewalk. And that, those, those sets of rules are very important and necessary. And so what Hugh Ferris is doing here is he's looking at those constraints um, in a formal way. He's looking at how architecture formally and design-wise could then utilize these constraints and change their form and change their design. And he's like, he's going through all these possibilities of the constraints and rules of uh, uh, zoning laws. Um, so this is a fourth semester project Corey and I worked on together. Um, we were playing with this idea of zoning codes and their formal output. So you can see on the right side, we, have, we had a number, these are just a few, we had a number of formal operations that were these like building codes, you can call them rules, um, that were operating on, on this city that we designed to produce. Um, you see the left, there's the model of the city. Um, to see these codes in action, this is a video. Again, this video is allowing us to not deal with the constraints of time. Uh, we're uh, changing the parameter inputs and it's changing the formal outputs of our city based on these rules that we show on the previous page. Um, and you can see there's this, there's this really interesting thing where like you move a, a subway line or a street creates different parts, you change the density, buildings grow over, get smaller. Um, it's just a really fascinating thing uh, to just sort of explore through video. Um, this is our final model for that project and I think we're a little disappointed with how dynamic that rule set was that we had created, that the system we designed. Um, and so we were a little disappointed with this one iteration that ended up being the total final thing. We were looking at immersive technology as a way to continue exploring this idea of uh, not having the constraint of time in architecture. Um, so this is our game, Homic. It's set in a sphere, and on, on the interior of the sphere, we map a city with a similar rule set to our previous project, Medicode. And um, in this game, the city is constantly changing. You know, grids are changing, buildings are changing, densities are changing. Uh, with this idea that you can continually explore, discover uh, new possibilities within the, this, the environment. Uh, yeah. So ultimately, I think it's it's extremely presumptuous to assume that architecture or or let's say uh, video games, for that matter, can really make make anyone do anything. Um, there's a certain uh, social agreement that if 
when we walk into a school, we're going to sit down and study, or we're going to uh, observe a lecture. Uh, but there's nothing inherent um, to architecture that facilitates that. I mean, no doubt it can help. Um, it can help, but there's nothing so specific. You can never design a school that's so specifically a school uh, that it couldn't function as a house or a, or a prison, let's say. Um, so ultimately, um, homemade I think lies in this in this middle ground of expectation and, and discovery, and um, it's about kind of never being aware, uh, never being aware of your constraints, and always be up to interpretation. And so you know we came here, you know, we're talking about our influences, uh, and specifically how architecture has influenced our video our, our video game. Uh, but to us, video games and immersive technologies are just a part of this long lineage of representation that come with their own set of constraints and possibilities uh, for understanding architecture. Thank you.